Well, Dylan calls it a conspiracy. You could call it a myth, a uh, hoax. I don't really know, but kind of interesting where you find these balloons out in the woods. Dylan, you heard that online? I heard it from Brett Smith. Okay, <laughs> so we'll blame him. Yeah. <laughs> so Brett, if you're uh, watching this, thank you. <laughs> but anyways, uh, where balloons are, where you find them in the woods is a good buck bedding area, right? Just 100%. What do you think, Dylan? Hey man, the conspiracy is really starting to add up. <laughs> and we were in a cool area right here and there was buck bedding in this area. And this is an area that's interior of our woods. And if you can see up to the top, the field edge is not that far away. I would estimate 80 to 100 yards from where we're standing right here. We also have our big fields of corn that were there during the winter time up there. And I would say it's about 150 yards away across the hollow and up. So actually a little bit of distance the way the deer would come down into her. So I wanted to talk about how would we hunt this and what we do, regardless of whether these balloons mean anything or not. And what's interesting about this is we have a lot of trails coming into this location. Um, they're coming out of the corner of this hollow up top. They're coming out of the ag fields in the morning or going to that location in the evening. And the big temptation for a lot of bedding areas, really good X and movement patterns that are interior like this, is to go stick a stand in here. And you can see we have a lot of great trees uh, to put stands in. Uh, right back in here, we have some good white oaks. And then going up the hill, you can see a lot of mature timber, shagbark hickory going all the way up to the field edge. So we have a lot of trees that we could potentially put stands in here. If you look right over here, some more white oak. So we have some decent white oak in this area to put a stand and that's, and again, that big temptation. So I look at it, all these deer are coming out of this corner right here potential bedding right here and that's also indicated by the balloons and I'm not just kidding about these balloons we've just found we were right over here uh, you can see the Kubota came down here we picked up one right here one on this side and then if you look into this area here's another old one right here <clears throat> another happy birthday there's one right here. That's just a nice smiley happy face. And Dylan, I think. There's one on the up back side of that log there. And there's one right over there still too. So this is pretty crazy. I, I don't know if that's six or seven. Yeah, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, and then I see seven right down there. So these are seven balloons in the entire woods in this entire area. We haven't found balloons anywhere else. I went for a long hike over here. Now, surely I just think it's coincidental. I'm not creating this video to show you how to find balloons and then find bedding areas. We need to hunt this area whether the balloons are here or not. This is a great potential bedding area on the shelf here. It's away from the fields, 150 yards from both sides once you get down in this flat. It's thick, has a lot of briars. You get some southerly exposure right here, especially the southwest afternoon sun. So you get some high sun, get some regeneration along this draw down here. And again, we need to figure out how to hunt this. So I'm just gonna grab these balloons real quick and we'll discuss the strategy. The temptation is to hunt down here and I'm gonna show you why you shouldn't hunt down here and where you should hunt, should hunt. And part of it has to do with these balloons. Um, you could feel, like you can't feel, I can feel. If you were here, you could. The wind is right on my back this morning. And I'm, my back is facing south, regardless of which way the wind is. This is a long howl that goes down. It's probably about a mile all the way down to the valley, which is a, a road or two lane road down below. So these morning thermals are just whipping up this. And so you can imagine if there's south winds, these balloons are going to travel all the way up to the top right here. And what that indicates to me is strong thermals that are predictable and that you can count on. And we're gonna use that to hunt this location and I'll talk about that entire setup here after we grab some more balloons. What do we got? That's another number five, birthday. another happy birthday. And it's similar to one of the other ones. Happy birthday. Now it wouldn't surprise me too, you know, almost all these are happy birthday. They're similar, similar balloons. They look similarly faded. So I'm thinking someone had a happy birthday party about a mile behind us down the draw. 
they're all up here. They came up here together and they collected. They hit these tall trees once they got to the top of the draw. What do you think, Dylan? Or did they collect over the last decade? I think they're coming because from it's a, long a good way. buck spot. I think they're coming from a very, very long way. <laughs> and the thermals just bring them here. Yeah, and I agree with that. The thermals do bring them in here. But that'll help us hunt this location too. Another smiley face. Happy birthday, balloon. I'm seeing a pattern. General overall theme, happy birthday. Now I'd bet we're missing one or two in here. Did we see any more, Dylan? The other day? But that's seven so far, so that's quite a bit. Now the, I love counting on thermals. That's the one thing about hills is that you can cheat the wind. The problem is, again, this is such an attractive spot down here. We actually have this flat behind Dylan. It's very thick, full of briars. And then we have this arena right here with the opening that way. What that means is in the morning, if we're getting southerly winds, you're going to follow the straw. But once it gets light in here, then as the temperatures change and that air starts to lift, temperatures are going up. Then think about when those temperatures are going up, the thermals are going to go up too. For example, today, I think it's supposed to be a high of 77 and it was 46 when we started out the morning. So huge temperature changes all the way till 2, 3 in the afternoon. So you can count on those thermals going up that entire time. When we're down here in this flat and we're below the, the level of the ground up there, and these thermals are coming up into this bowl area, then yes, they are going to go uphill. But at the same time, there's a lot of hill and side cover, side hill around here to get those thermals swirling, especially as it gets into the middle of the day. So what we need to do is get above this. And what that helps us with too is if that wind is coming from the north in the morning it's going to head out over this hollow it's going to shoot right back uphill and so we get to hunt a stand location up top here with a north wind or a southerly wind that takes advantage of why these thermals are strong and coming into this location in the first place so a lot of times that temptation is to hunt right here on this flat and in this entire movement i'd rather be on the outside of it and this sets up the perfect scenario where I shoot the majority of my bucks and that's above the deer, wind in my face, whether on paper it's at my back and it's swirling around in front of me or it's coming up this hollow. And that's why you have to look at a stand location. You can't just say moving as is on this side. I have to hunt it with the wind coming this way. And in the morning you get that wind going uphill. It's pretty easy to predict. You can also have that wind come from your back circle around and go back uphill. So as long as you're above the deer in the morning, you're doing really well. Again, the temptation with being down here in this flat, the wind can swirl around, go back uphill. If there's deer above you, they're going to scent you. And at some point in the middle of the day, your winds are going to swirl around. And especially for an afternoon hunt, it would be impossible to hunt in here because even if you could blow your scent up here, say strong, strong south winds coming uphill, then you have to worry about deer getting behind you and going out into the ag fields. If the winds are zero to three miles an hour or less, five miles an hour or less, which I use by a guard, a guide, then what will happen is even a south wind in the afternoon that's blowing strong up this draw, you know, from way down below, it has to be strong enough to push your scent to the top because of the evening thermals. And what will happen is even if you had a moderate wind speed, say eight to 10 miles an hour, 12 miles an hour, that might be great for the first half of your sit, the first two thirds, three quarters of your sit. But once those winds go below five and especially three miles an hour, they're not gonna be strong enough to lift up the draw and they're gonna go right back down and saturate this entire area. I don't wanna take any chances with a stand location. So we take a good area like this, we're adding bedding area over here and cutting bedding area because we're not gonna be hunting on this point that juts out in between a couple food plots up top right up here we'll go up there next but i'll talk about why that's a lot more of an advantageous location because i want to pull myself outside of this balloon area this bedding area whatever it is this location where a lot of deer are moving together and i want to get on the outside edge of it and these hills allow me to do so and it wouldn't be any different if it was flatland you'd be on that upper edge you wouldn't obviously be sitting in here because you have a lot of ground behind you where deer could actually travel to and if you look back in here you can see the hollow extending and we have field at the end of this all the way around road field and you can see this draw right here it's very very steep going down so as opposed to deer going down the draw and back up and going up this really steep terrain it just drops off significantly 
then they're going to travel along this shelf. And the deer trails indicate that too. They go this way, rubs and scrapes, and then you can see it is very, very steep going down into that. So those deer in that situation, when you have hill country like this, they don't wanna go across that steep gorge and ravine unless they're pushed or they really have to. So we have a lot of movement coming through here. We're on the lower end of the movement, if that makes sense, because deer aren't going to be traveling through this ravine unless they're on the other side. You can see a steep cut going up the hill on the other side. So that pushes deer even further away from that point. So really, realistically, we're at the bottom of the movement here. There's a nice bench going right uphill up here. And we'll walk up there next and I'll show how this comes together and we can hunt this area safely. Well, we just found number eight, believe it or not. So we're gonna go grab it and uh, add that to our balloon collection. I'm thinking this is a really hot spot. We got balloons, we got big bucks. Happy birthday. Now we talked about this location, another area about how to avoid a bad food pot location. And so, you know, a lot of times these setups take a lot more than, hey, there's a lot of crossings in this location, a lot of signs, so let's just put a stand. There's a lot more thought that goes into the setups for myself and, and hopefully for you too, a lot more strategy that goes into it. So this field is actually being converted to uh, all switchgrass. It's already switchgrassed. I've already sprayed it with Simazine. I'll hit it with 2,4-D and round, round up a combination here in a little bit of just uh, two quartz breaker, glyphosate, one pint breaker, 2,4-D. That'll be when I get back in a couple weeks from a Michigan trip. So we're looking at another two weeks. Weed should be up in here, whatever the Simzine didn't kill and we'll get a great kill on it. But this switchgrass in this area sets up a prime stand location up here. What I like about this again is that we have that great location about 100 yards from the woods edge here down off this corner. So this is a little bump out right here. We have big food. You can kind of see it in the distance over there where it gets light through the trees. That food extends for about 275 yards that way. That's a, that's a holding plot where we expect to hold deer there and then after dark they go out to these surrounding ag fields that are owned by the neighbor. So it's a really good pattern where we can hold the deer until dark, make sure they repeat that pattern every day. And part of repeating that pattern every day is making sure we don't go down there and get in that X movement and spook them out. So I wanna get as close as I can to the edge of that movement without spooking deer and these very predictable thermals that are bringing balloons up into this hollow uh, will allow me to do that. So let's, let's go here and take a little further look at this. So what I like about this area is we have this bump out that's pointed at where we were just at and where we picked up the balloons down below. And you feel that wind hitting us in the face right here. So we can count on that. In fact, it's angling up here because it's parallel in the hollow, which is over there. So we could have this wind blowing out in the morning and take advantage of this. You can see this bump out right here. Well, we have a steep ravine down there. And that's what I was talking about. Just 100 yards from here is where that ravine actually begins and then we have another ravine over to the left so these deer are really pushed down right in front of us we have this perfect bump out here of this hillside because then we can walk into a certain point so what i'm trying to do is i'm considering well if this is going to be an afternoon stand too i can't walk and expose myself too far into this face because now the whole hollow can see me walking in so i want to get to a point where i can sneak through the switch grass and get into a spot like this and then look downhill and you can see right down here we have a pretty good bench system just right down here 25 30 yards away that extends up into the mouth of the hollow so i wanted to get into a position right here i'll use maybe a big trunk like that to walk behind we have a shag bar kicker i could put a stand in right here um, there's some really nice white oak down there but i don't want to go all the way down there and expose myself. I might be able to get into there for the morning, but still I have that chance of something being up here. So I'm looking at like, there's a decent trail 10 yards away, 25 yards away, and then some good trails 40, 50 yards down. I wanna be maybe at that top trail to make sure I don't get anything behind me. I wanna make sure that I do not go down here too far and expose myself to the entire hollow right here where deer can see me in the afternoon. And then I wanna make sure that again, I'm going into a position where I can tap into that movement the best. If I go around the ridge system, I'm getting into the uh, draw on the other side, and that makes it so I can't hunt this movement right here, which is primarily on this side of the ridge. So I need to pick something close in here. We'll have a nice quiet access 
I'm thinking the shag bar kickery might be the best. It's a good strong tree anyways. It looks like it's uh, leaning the right way. And then we have this trunk behind it of this white oak. We have some large trunks up here. So I feel like I can get in there and stay pretty hidden. And that's as close as I want to get to that movement. I'd rather see a buck travel by 80 to 100 yards that I wanted to shoot. And I lived to hunt another day and I didn't spook them. But boy, as we're sitting here, you can just feel this wind going up here in the morning. So I'm going to hunt this as a morning stand with thermals coming up and out of this hollow, tapping into this movement. The better we do with our food plot up there, it was all corn. So a lot of the sign just stacked up in here from December, January, February, and March. And they were really feeding on that corn. We found seven, eight sheds up that way. But I'm going to diversify that food plot up there so it's more 50% with the green blends, 50% corn, and then we'll spread corn over here. We're gonna have uh, corn in five locations this year to complement the greens. So we have that ultimate blend of that base of greens, which we have enough to make it through the entire season, and then corn. And we don't need beans or anything like that because we're not herd building. They're not gonna help me actually uh, create a quality herd here or a quality hunt. Um, I just simply don't need those beans. I think they do more harm than good. So we're looking at the green base and corn and I feel that'll allow me to compete with anybody around here as far as food goes and being able to build the best herd and hunt in the entire area and really tap into a lot of the other people around here that are um, purely using corn and beans. They're a big disadvantage when you don't have that base of green. In the evening, I have to be very concerned. I want eight, 10, 12 mile an hour sustained winds, six mile an hour at least, um, and that's even pushing it because the closer it gets to dark, the more power the thermals have to go downhill. And I'm talking that last half hour, 45 minutes. And so unless I have those sustained winds, then my scent is immediately at some point going to start saturating this hillside right here where I expect deer travel to come through. And of course, that'd be a really bad thing. So um, I need sustained winds of six to eight, 10 miles an hour plus in the evening. And that'll be affected by the size of the hill. You know, we're talking hundreds of feet of elevation change, probably 600 feet all the way down to the bottom in this location. So the greater the, the uh, elevation change, the potential of stronger thermals. But bottom line is, you get to those zero and low mile per, hour, mile per hour right before dark, your wind is going to shift downhill because you're not just going to have those thermals lifting up anymore and you don't have enough wind to push all the way up the hollow. So I want to be able to plan on a morning and evening hunt here. Really once we get up there, it's, it's more of a transition area. I want deer to feel free that they could go out to the ag fields that way or other food plots. There's no other woods that someone can hunt. And um, so we're bringing them to a safe location, which is why we're spending a lot of our resources and big food up into the top of this hollow because we want to pull deer up here every night, send them to the ag fields after the dark. The ag fields become the destination field. There's a, there's a difference between a destination plot or food source and a holding plot. We have holding plots, and that's what I encourage you to have. Most destination plots, 95% are after dark and uh, because people overhunt them, pressure them. And then ag is a low value, but constant, safe, social food source at night and deer prefer to be out in those big open fields if it's not bad weather. And so I'm holding the deer on holding plots here and then I'm sending out the ag after dark. I love ag, I just don't like ag on my own property. I want ag on someone else's property so I can use this movement, tap into that movement with food plots and with advantageous locations like this. And now we'll be able to set this up for an evening and morning stand. Seems like a lot of work for just one location because we're creating a bedding area down there We'll create more bedding up here. We have a giant food source that way, giant food source that way. But we're in that bow tie movement between bedding areas, major food sources, and you can bet a uh, huge cruising. There's actually one cruising trail just right in front of us right here. And that's that first one. So I don't want to get too far below that because you're going to have that opportunity for deer to be above you. Now at the same time, we're adding switchgrass up here. So when we look up towards the sky next year, certainly during hunting season, and this year it should be 30 inches, 40 inches high, we're gonna have a wall of switchgrass. That'll make those deer even feel more comfortable to come up to this top. And when you have the ag land up here and you have the food sources, when you have cut bedding areas on either side and they're more towards the top of the hollow, then there's a lot of reason for deer to be moving through this location. Now we're gonna make a video next talking about a new water hole location. And to me, this is prime for a water hole right down here to tap into that movement. Of course, we use a mock scrape at every stand location. And we'll actually consider a water hole 
in this location because the next one we're going to talk about next is probably a half mile away and, and on a property like this you know if you have 40 acres you could have two three water holes if you have elevation change if you don't maybe one to two two to three um, in a location like this where you have 178 acres we're probably looking at five to six water holes and they'll be well spaced and that places a priority on each one it's kind of like mock scrapes if you put 50 scrapes around a food plot, why, what's the value of one or the power of one? So I like making mock scrapes in front of my stand locations only for the most part, outside of maybe one census scrape on a major food source or something. And so we'll talk about ways to enhance this, possibly a water hole right down there. And, um, but definitely a morning and evening spot. And hey, bottom line, it's an eight balloon location. So it's gotta be really good, right Dylan? right <laughs> and uh thanks to uh brett smith for pointing that out and and uh we'll uh we'll keep an eye on that i'll try to remember that as i'm going through properties bottom line is and you know what's pretty cool dylan look what's in the tree over there get a balloon oh yeah <laughs> there's a balloon right over there so so that one's like uh 80 feet in the air so i think it's a little bit too it's right up there and um but uh that one's a little too high to get out of the woods i'm sure it'll come down someday maybe. Bottom line is they junk up the woods too. Be very careful when you're letting those go. They have to end up somewhere and they're trashing up the woods right here. We're taking it out and maybe it's a great spot to hunt. Regardless though, we're gonna hunt any anyways right here and we can't break, wait to bring this set up to you this fall. Hey guys, I really appreciate you watching today's video. We're out here having some fun today. We're planting some switchgrass, cutting some timber, making some bedding areas, but most importantly, we're putting it all together and that's critical. Any habitat improvements that you're making, you can't just make improvements because it's a good spot. You have to link those together so that helps your hunt this fall. Really, I encourage you to check out my web classes. The link is in the description. It's helped a lot of folks design their properties and do what we're out here having fun doing right now.